Thank you everyone for being here at TURN's webinar. We're very excited to have you join us. To start today, um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians throughout Australia, New Zealand and all nations. We honour their profound connections to land, water, biodiversity and culture and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people continue to play within our community. I'm speaking to you today from the Chibukai country, which is in far north Queensland amongst the Bama rainforest people. So thank you again for joining us today. And for those that haven't met me, my name is Beryl Morris and I'm the director of TURN, Australia's Ecosystem Observatory. We're having a web, webinar today on agriculture and ecosystems. TURN monitors all ecosystems in Australia, regardless of land use. And so it's always a big question as to what impact agricultural land use is having on ecosystems and whether there are uh, impacts on ecosystem services or disservice to those. So today, as you listen to our speakers, feel free to ask questions through the webcast Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of our speakers, we'll address those questions. But if you have any technical issues, put that in the chat and we'll try to sort that out fairly quickly for you. At the end of our webinar, we're going to display a rating survey that appears in a separate browser. It'd be really nice if you could take the time to complete that as you leave to help us with our reporting. We're recording today's webinar, which means that you can come back to it if you don't get to stay the whole journey today or if you want to pass it on to somebody else, we'll be giving you the link to that later. And we know that some of our um, registrants uh, actually are on different time zones and are planning to watch this um, when it's more convenient to them. We are really pleased to have so many different countries join us at our webinar and we're also pleased amongst the registrants to see people who've served on TURN's advisory board. Welcome, it's great to see you. Um, so today we're going to have three speakers and I'll introduce you to them uh, now, I'll just tell you a little bit about them, and they'll speak and pass the baton on to the next speaker as they go. So you won't hear it from me until the last speaker has finished, and then we'll do our Q&A part. So our first speaker today who's going to lead off is Dr. Ben McDonald from CSIRO, and Ben is co-lead of Turns Landscape uh, platform in uh, our observatory. He's also the group leader for the Soils and Landscapes program in CSIRO's Agriculture and Food. His research aims and, uh, are around improving resilience and sustainability of Australian and regional agroecosystems with a focus on quantification of gaseous exchange between the land surface and the atmosphere and the key processes responsible for emissions from agriculture and natural ecosystems. Our second speaker has been with TURN since its beginning in 2009, and probably before that, helping to prepare the, um, the bid to have it set up. And Professor Peter Grace at the University, at Queensland University of Technology, um, has many different uh, research areas. Amongst his current studies, he's working with industry looking at the carbon balance of grasslands. He's also been active in both the developed and developing world promoting the use of simple soil assays and educating landholders in soil management for maximizing long-term productivity and profitability. And our third speaker, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Anna Hopkins, who's a senior lecturer in molecular ecology in the School of Science at Edith Cowan University in Western Australia. And Anna's research interests include the soil microbes and plant fungal fauna interactions and the fungal plant pathogens in native ecosystems, plantation forests, and agriculture in both Australasia and Scandinavia. And her recent research interests have included understanding the impact of disturbances such as drought, fire, and urbanization on soil ecology and ecosystem health. And across those three speakers, we're going to get a wealth of information about agriculture and uh, its uh, relationship to the work that we're doing in turn on observing ecosystems. So I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Ben McDonald to start us off. Thanks, Ben.
Hello. So, can everyone hear me and share my see my screen? Yes. So, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ben McDonald, and thank you, Beryl, for the introduction. Uh, last week, she, we were asked to come together and present on agroecosystems and the, and monitoring and interaction with ecosystems. So today, we've got a feel of an overview from me, and then Peter and Anna will um, continue on. I'm presenting a lot of work from a range of people from inside turn and and they've contributed uh, to a lot of the different aspects. So um, thank you to all their contributions. So just as an overview today, I'll talk about Australian land use and turn monitoring locations and, and the intersection of those two. Some of the turn national products, which you know, are important for agro ecosystems. And I'll touch on some of the monitoring of croplands and and soils, which we do with the uh, program. So why would we want to measure and monitor Australian um, agricultural systems? Well, when we look at the Australian land use pattern, the majority of the landscape is in, in managed lands. This little slither over here is the highly modified environment. It's all our urban areas. The large um, blowout triangle is the conservation indigenous estate. And the rest of the nation is in some sort of agricultural production system. The majority of that is grazing, so 55%. And out of that, it's rangeland grazing is the majority. Minimum, minimal use is 15%. This is terminology of a bears, really refers to like traveling stock routes, defense lands, those sort of things. Cropping is also a, a, a smaller proportion. So this is dry land and the majority of cropping is dry land and very and a percentage of that is um, irrigated. Forestry is only about 1.7%. So in terms of understanding ecosystems and ecosystem interactions, the monitoring of agro ecosystems is, is, is fairly important. So why, what's the need for the monitoring? Why would we want to do it? And I could, there's many examples which we could talk about in terms of trying to understand um, agricultural ecosystems. We could talk about salinity, talk about you know, dry land, um, to talk about acidity in the dry land cropping zones you know, acid sulfate soils, and it's a fairly um, stark example. So here in the picture, we have a photo, it's a photo of Ginny Ginny Creek in the Manning River in New South Wales. And that plume is a plume of this aluminium entering the um, main uh, body of water there. And that has basically been produced from the oxidation of pyrite in the, land, in the floodplain, weathering the environment, and that being discharged into the river systems. This issue was identified in East Coast Australia in the 1960s. And it was just taken as an interesting fact and not much policy development was um, taken on from that. Uh, this, was, this work was done by the late Pat Walker. It wasn't until 1987 that the issue really raised its head where we had river clarification, massive fish kills on the Tweed River which then stimulated a monitoring program. And quite quickly, you know, the scientific and the government agencies were um, galvanized and industry to try to understand the issues which were causing these, this acidification. Pat's earlier work was rediscovered and a lot of monitoring went in. The evapotranspiration was identified as the principal driver from the monitoring of the water cycle Soil survey revealed that there was large amounts of stored acidity in the in the soils, up to 50 tons to, to the hectare of soluble sulfuric acid, and even up to 100 kilogram, tons per hectare in some instances. When we tried to understand the hydrology, we see that drainage and land level was if affecting the acidity flux from the soil out into the river. And we're sort of measuring about now, they were finding about 1.1 to 0.5 tons to the hectare of equivalent sulfuric acid leaching out of the system. Now, from that monitoring, which took about a decade, you know, 
ma management and policy interventions could be put in place where you know, drains were in field liming and a, a thorough understanding of what was going on and also the impact on, on the downstream aquatic systems. So you know, in terms of monitoring, understanding agricultural land use is, is very important. And as I said, you know, we want to we want to do this so we can basically understand eco agro ecosystem function, because without that understanding, we it's very difficult to develop sustainable management. As Beryl pointed out, turn works across many landscapes and many land uses to try to understand ecosystem information and develop uh, tools and processes and and knowledge for people to make informed management decisions. So where does TURN work? So, you know, across the ecosystem surveillance sites, we've got many locations which are regularly sampled. And since 20, 2011, soil samples, vegetation samples have been taken from all these uh, purple, uh, purple, green dots across the uh, Australian continent and some land uses and, and, and not in others. In terms of landscapes, which is another part of TURN, there's a number of calibration validation sites where information is collected and also COSMOS sites, which is in where um, soil moisture is measured on a real time basis. More broadly, Turn Landscapes also has developed the National Soil Grid, which is its soil information layers are at a 90 metre resolution to understand uh, soil properties. So we cover a lot of information. And finally, Turn Ecosystem Processes has a number of super sites which actually look at ecosystem exchange to understand the, the water, carbon and energy balance in a number of environments. And three of the sites are primarily in um, managed landscapes being grazing. And Peter will talk about that during his talk and what, what's measured and the outcomes. So what are some of the national products which are coming out of all this monitoring? So probably more recently, we've just developed the Continental Daily, Daily Soil Moisture product. The schematic which is playing is representing the um, soil moisture content at a one kil kilometer resolution um, on a daily basis, the blue being high and, and, and the um, red being low. And this has been derived out of information which has been collected from a range of land uses uh, from a, across the country. So there's cosmic ray information being collected from soil for soil moisture monitoring, in-ground soil moisture probe network from around a, a range of providers is being assessed. Climate information, the national soil grid data points and time series vegetation cover dynamics to get an understanding of this daily soil moisture product. From that, policymakers and growers can make assessments and decisions about planting and growing of crops, and an understanding of land capability and assessment. Going forward, we want to take this work and actually start developing drought forecast models, looking at you know using SMIPS to generate current soil moisture understanding using three month rainfall crop productivity to actually try to develop a drought potential uh, map for the cropping regions of Australia to un and, and to get a understanding and long-term uh, product productivity index for those regions. Also, Turns Landscapes is thinking, is looking to look at soil organic carbon as a quite a topical subject but using the existing soil information, try to de de derive a maximum soil organic carbon content for the country. Look at what currently is there and basically look at the difference between those two to get a saturation deficit, to look at the potential of sequestration across the landscape. This gives us a number of um, tools. There's the soil carbon sequestration potential, but also gives you a, a quasi index of soil health. These, these products will be further strengthened by the 
new developments within the Australian soil, National Soil Information System. So this is a door funded project, which is looking to improve soil information across the country, where, we, uh, where more data points will be ingested within the system. And it's a collaborative piece of work, which is bringing in different tiers of government as well as um, states and territories. And this information coupled with some of the outputs which have already, already been developed by turn will be further improved by the new information which is coming. When we look at monitoring and at a, at a um, regional scale, and we drill down to the farm level, we want to understand what soils and landscapes are doing to derive plant available soil water. This figure on the right is uh, plant available soil moisture on a daily basis for the CSRO farm at, at Burrawa. Now getting down to this finer, finer scale to understand what's happening at a farm level, we'll take an understanding of um, soils and landscape processes linked to the SMIPS data products and regional soil moisture measurements to get down an understanding of how soil moisture is changing at a landscape, at a, at a uh, soil landscape interaction. At the farm that's possible because we've got a lot of um, detailed soil information and also uh, soil moisture products, uh, soil moisture probes across the landscape which allows us to derive this. So from that sort of understanding, the, the, the SMIPS understanding, hopefully you know, there'll be a point in time where we can get down to this final level of detail. When we look at net eco, ecosystem exchange, cropping landscapes and management, we look at the ecosystem processes of what and, and measurement. There's a number of short term studies around the country and Jamie cleverly has pulled that together in a paper, which is here, which is the output here, here which is looking at trying to understand the linkages between crop productivity, climate and management interactions. One of the, when there's good work done using this, the short term ad hoc um, measurements and you know, there's work here by Jackie Webb looking at carbon dynamics and sugarcane cropping and its interactions with estuaries in Northern New South Wales. There's some work in the cotton sector. It's also work down here where we've been, where they've been, where they were using the net ecosystem exchange from short term studies to validate for validation and calibration of models to further to, for, so to enable the development and understanding of carbon and nitrogen cycles for, in different soil types and apply that at a more national scale. But the real issue we have is the uh, measurements at this of net ecosystem exchange on at the farm level and cropping is short term and ad hoc. So there's only so much we can do with this information. We get powerful insights, but deeper and longer, longer term data sets are needed to get that fundamental understanding across longer term climatic changes. So in conclusion, agricultural land use is a significant proportion of the Australian continent. With this, there's been important integration, monitoring, quantification has been undertaken by turn. This is evident by the soil moisture products, soil landscape grid of Australia to name two, as many others. But I think there's an opportunity to look at a coordinated monitoring program, which includes net eco ex ecosystem exchange for agro ecosystems such as uh, cotton, uh, such, such as for uh, dryland cropping, irrigated cropping, and grazing systems. And with that, I'll hand over to Peter, who's going to run us through some of the work he's been doing in grazing. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Um, well, hopefully I, uh, everyone can hear me. If not, let me know. The um, Yeah, that's a great um, segue into actually what I'm just about to put up on the screen. So I'm going to take uh, the look at what is 
evolving quickly in Australia and globally carbon neutral agriculture. Now, um, there's been a lot done in the last five years, particularly globally, but this is actually politically very sensitive, as you can imagine, climate change, climate change mitigation, um, climate change climate change adaptation, but um, I'll, I'll put some more context to that. Now, you might think um, in Australia, wh where does agriculture sit in all of this? Why are we talking about it? Uh, we all seem to think that it's a major emitter. Well, yes, 15% of Australia's greenhouse gas emissions come from the agriculture sector. Uh, and there's been a lot um, discussed about how they one can reduce their emissions, but also how they can play a role in actually uh, carbon offsets and uh, creating carbon in the landscape. Now, if we look at these emissions in Australia, they're about uh, 75 uh, million tonnes of carbon dioxide. And we, we have three greenhouse gases, actually. Carbon dioxide is the one everyone knows about but methane from animals, which has an impact on the environment 25, 30 times as uh, potent as CO2 in terms of its uh, global warming potential. And then you have this other uh, gas, nitrous oxide, which is uh, the same as the laughing gas our friendly dentist uses. And it is the majority of the emissions from Australia come from the agricultural sector in terms of nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is highly potent in terms of its global warming, about 300 times CO2. Now you can see from that graphic, the um, main contribution from the agriculture sector is uh, cattle, livestock. Uh, enteric fermentation. And there's a lot of research going on globally and in Australia on reducing this carbon footprint from the uh, livestock sector. But uh, we're going to focus a bit on agricultural soils because as Ben has shown, there's a lot of work now going into, and there's a lot of investment going into soils in Australia in, because historically, uh, when you think about soils, they've been They've been exploited quite a bit in terms of agricultural production. This is just a quick graphic to give you just an idea of the complexity of agriculture and the greenhouse gas emissions you can expect. Again, you can see here the pathways to the three main gases, methane um, from cattle, nitrous oxide uh, from any nitrogen source and fertilizers a nitrogen source. It's used prolifically globally. Uh, and also CO2 from soil. And this is where we're going to really uh, focus in uh, during the rest of this talk. Soil is a major source of carbon dioxide. Um, but on the other hand, if a soil is not emitting carbon dioxide, it means there's something wrong. And actually the more it is emitting, the better it is provided you're balancing that carbon that's coming out. And that's what, soil carbon is all about. Soil carbon is actually the largest pool of organic carbon on earth. It's greater than all the trees and the, uh, the lawns and everything you see, grasslands. It's the, it's the carbon in soil. One to five percent of the topsoil is organic carbon. Uh, and just to give you an example, um, an AFL football field, uh, just if you skim the top off of that, you'd have 20 tonnes of carbon in that soil if you removed it. That's, that's a significant amount. Now, globally, not just Australia, you'll see this to this very day. Uh, this is in the uh, Western area of Victoria, the Mallee countries. And it is just, you can see where the native vegetation was cleared and you can see the impact of years and years Tech decades of conventional farming, ploughing, releasing CO2. So the, the carbon in soil decomposes, the microbes reduce it, that to CO2 and it goes into the atmosphere. So that's a net loss to the system, to the ecosystem. But, and this is a, a common, this still exists to this very day, but in cropping systems, it has been reversed slightly over time. But 
the hidden solution to global warming is soil carbon. Now, it's not the silver bullet, but in many ways, if you can increase soil carbon, even if you're not creating a carbon credit, which is measurable, and I'll talk about that shortly, it is great in terms of the health and productivity of your soil. Soil carbon is an indicator of all the other nutrients that are there. So soil, soil carbon is the main element in, in soils. Then you have nitrogen, phosphorus, all the micro elements that are part of uh, growth and development of plants. So soil carbon is the main indicator. And, we, and the graphic on the right, you can see soil carbon is actually a product of what you add to the soil. You're adding uh, above ground biomass, you're adding roots. So the more biomass, the more carbon you're adding from external sources or growing there, that's contributing to soil carbon. That's critical. Now, in 2015, the uh, International Convention, um, actually the main, one of the main areas they wanted to focus on globally is this decarbonisation, re, sorry, sorry about that, recarbonisation of global soils. It's they're being decarbonised enough. But the idea, the idea here is to increase carbon. That means it's taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, but also it's improving soil health and productivity for agricultural production. So it's a win-win situation. Now, the quickest way to do that, and just look this graphic here, you can see on the on the y-axis the tons of carbon per hectare. It's a it's a it's a reasonably idealistic um, graphic, but way back when when those uh, virgin lands were opened up, you then got a clearing and you got a decrease in carbon, CO two into the atmosphere. Now. Uh, and well, probably for the last 10, 20, 30 years, there's been a bit of it, there's been a change in terms of moving more to conservation agriculture. And that includes better farming methods for cropping, but also, and not, not cultivating as much, but also moving more to permanent pastures, grasslands, or in rotation. And what that will do will slowly bring these carbon levels up. It won't happen overnight. So it's a very slow process. That's one of the problems we do have if you want to do this routinely in terms of claiming a credit how do you know you're actually getting there in the first place and be paid for it again we'll just move on to that shortly this is a bit of a sleeper in terms of uh, greenhouse gases and carbon credits people i don't think recognize enough that you might get a carbon credit if you increase um, the amount of trees on your farm or in a plantation or in soil, but if you've added any fertilizers or if you've managed it in a way that uh, um, is detrimental, you may switch the balance from carbon being CO2, net CO2 being taken up into the soil and uh, you might switch it the other way around. What here is a very old photo across the fence where uh, a farm has received the same amount of um, rainfall. On the right, it, it, it's been farmed in conservation agriculture. So the water drains in. On the left, it's actually waterlogged. And that waterlogging causes major, has a major impact in terms of what happens to, in terms of greenhouse gases. Methane, nitrous oxide, they're the real, they're the real big ones in terms of global warming potential. And um, the more they're released in, into the atmosphere, the bigger the problem we have. So when you do all this, you've got to do all of this accounting. You've got to do changes in soil carbon, but you've also got to do methane and nitrous oxide. The Australian government through its emissions reduction fund um, actually have invested a lot in developing methods that farmers can actually be credited for soil carbon change. It, you can't be credited for something you've already done. You have to be changing the method. You have to be changing the practice that you're already involved in. And if it lets you sequester carbon and then you look at this uh, credit and you look at the balance, because you've got to look at the debits from the non-CO2 emissions, uh, you can be paid a credit on the carbon market. 
Um, the title of this document is Understanding Your Soil Carbon Project. Uh, what I think is not understood very well is soil carbon is not, um, it is slow in the process, but also is, it can be transient in terms of increases because it's all dependent on what's above ground and what gets into the ground. Okay, so you might have a, a lush uh, a crop or pasture one year, but then this, this, this photo uh, from a colleague of mine actually shows a few years later during a drought, no biomass, no, no carbon being added to the soil. So you can see what would happen there, the carbon levels go down. And this whole idea of permanence is a critical area in terms of the carbon contract you would be uh, part of if you signed up with the government or any voluntary scheme. The other area to be really careful of is this, and this is what I'll be talking about further in terms of where turn, the role of turn. Um, soil carbon, it's highly variable in terms of its spatial variability. The numbers you get when you take a soil sample, and you can see here, this is 25 hectares, 50 samples, highly variable, you can see here, from the uh, legend, and you can just you can see from the landscape photos themselves. I mean, it, it's very non-uniform. What is the role of turn now? Uh, one, as uh, Ben has already pointed out, the land, the soil and landscape grid, critical in terms of us identifying the areas where you can store carbon, uh, uh, like optimize your storage of carbon, and they are the clay soils. And many of these clay soils are in. Queensland, the vertisols, and this can be these are identified through this um, through the grid. The other aspect now I'm going to focus in is the Ausflux network, and what that is looking at. That's looking at, and Ben's already touched on this net ecosystem exchange. What that is, the net exchange of carbon or in the form of carbon dioxide, and um, here is. Uh, a picture from our Gundawindi site where we have what we call a flux tower or an eddy covariance flux tower, measuring fluxes of carbon dioxide, water, and looking at the energy balance, radiation, all critical areas in terms of plant production and carbon cycling. So from these towers, which are, I would call them souped up weather stations in many ways, you have a situation where we can look at carbon exchange dynamically. We don't have to wait these long periods of time to find out whether a management practice is actually sequestering carbon. We run this data through a variety of models, which gives us uh, highly accurate information in terms of whether you're actually sequestering, increasing carbon. And instead of having, it, what it does, um, the graphic, the two graphics up on the right, you can see it's actually integrating large areas. So that spatial variability is actually negated here. It's, there's, there's an integration of all that information. Um, just quickly, what happens at these sites? Um, if you look at the graphic down below, um, net ecosystem exchange, as Ben has said, if it's positive, it means there's a loss of carbon out of the system. If it's negative, it means carbon's being taken up by the vegetation and uh, into the soil, a net, net uptake. And you can see rainfall events. Here is rainfall and you get a bit of a spike because you get some decomposition going on. Okay, uh, here's another rainfall event, a bit of a spike. Uh, and um, if we looked at this same site, we had two different treatments where we measured the soils on the site and we also had flux towers on the site. On the left, site one was uh, unimproved grassland, site two was improved grassland. But the data here, why access soil carbon, this box plot shows there is no significant difference. So if I went to the government to get a credit, they'd say, no, sorry, you don't get anything. But if you look at the flux towers here, site one, I'm sorry, site, I've got them back the front there, improved grassland was the blue, unimproved was the, was the or, uh, brown. But if you look at the flux trace, and this is the cumulative trace over time, we've actually taken up more carbon in the improved grassland, which we, all, which we always thought would be the case, but the soil sampling did not show that. Moving on, we've, we've now, there's the, turn sites in blue 
uh, Meat and Livestock Australia, McDonald's, Rabobank, a number of private industry uh, have invested in flux towers uh, all up the East Coast in grazing systems because they want information on soil carbon change. Uh, we've built different flux towers, portable flux towers, mobile flux towers, um, again, um, using LICOR systems mostly. So in summary, improved management of ag soils can provide solutions to global warming. You can increase carbon for credits. It is possible, but you've got to view it very cautiously. For example, permanence. It's soil carbon, increasing it for soil health is the number one outcome you need. Don't forget the non-CO2 emissions are debits and TURN's capability in this area is invaluable in contributing to global warming solutions. Just a couple of slides. If you go here, n2o.net.au, you can see uh, more of this information. Um, there's some calculators there as well in terms of how you can see what your emissions are like uh, in various en in your enterprise if you're a uh, grower, farmer. And uh, I'll now, this is the um, segue to Anna in terms of soils. Uh, we've touched on it in, in, in a bit more detail here and I think Anna is now going to drill down a bit further. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks, Peter. That was a really great introduction to what I'm going to talk about. And um, thanks, Ben, for your great presentation. And also thanks, Beryl, for inviting me to speak here today. Um, I'm Anna Hopkins. I'm uh, from the Centre for People, Place and Planet at ECU in Perth. And I'd just like to start my presentation by acknowledging that I live and work on Wajak Noongar country and the um, pay respects to the Wajak Noongar people um, and their elders past and present. So what I'm going to do is um, drill down a little bit into the soil and what's living in the soil and talk a little bit about, um, first of all, what we can find in the soil and then that, how that relates to our agricultural systems in Australia. Um, let's just see if I can... Great. Um, so... As you may be aware now from Ben and Peter's talks, soils uh, provide lots and lots of different uh, key ecosystem services. So um, Peter talked a lot about carbon sequestration and gave us a really good um, number of examples of how soils are important for carbon sequestration. Uh, ben talked a lot about climate regulation and nutrient cycling. What I'm going to focus in on now is really about soils as a habitat for different organisms, as those organisms being important for nutrient cycling, and also about how we can um, work in our agricultural systems to retain the habitat and the nutrient cycling successfully, and also um, still provide food and agriculture and other um, outputs from our systems. So I like to start uh, talks to the general public about um, soils by comparing them to a lake ecosystem. And I think that this is a really interesting and useful parallel. So bear with me. Um, so if we look into a freshwater ecosystem, we can see that it has a really diverse biota within it. We can look into the water and we can see that there are fish in the water or there are other snails and things. We can look along the bottom of the, the river ecosystem and see that there are little aquatic plants growing up from the ecosystem. We can see that there are logs and rocks and things in that ecosystem providing different types of habitat. So we can see that there's lots of different types of biota in that system. And we can also see that there's lots of different types of habitats in that system. Soils are very much the same in terms of ecosystem, but it's a lot more difficult to imagine them being quite as diverse because we can't see into soils in the same way that we can see into water. So although soils, just look like dirt to us, they're actually very, very diverse and filled with all sorts of exciting and interesting biota. So about a quarter of um, the world's biodiversity is found in soils. And I've put some examples up here. So they range from very, very small things. So bacteria and fungi, the microbes that I'm particularly interested in, 
all sorts of very, very small invertebrates and arthropods of other kinds. We all know about earthworms that live in the soil. And then there are other bigger things too. Um, we don't have moles but like this, but um, things like um, wombats and, and other things dig within the soil too. So there's a whole range of different types of um, biota that live within the soil. And one of the reasons, I think there's two reasons why we don't really think about them very much. One of them is because it's difficult to see into the soil unless you kind of dig into the soil and pick up handfuls of soil. So it's hard to imagine that there's so many things living in the soil. And the other reason I think is because a lot of these things are so, so tiny. So if you took a teaspoon of soil, um, that teaspoon of soil probably has um, a million to a billion different bacteria in it. So it's looking thinking about something that's very tiny and very difficult for us to um, see with the naked eye. The other reason that I think that, well, one of the reasons that I think that soil biota are so diverse is because soils actually contain lots and lots of different types of habitats. So just like our lake ecosystem that I was talking about or our river ecosystem had rocks and sandy soils and um, different plants and things that provide habitat for the animals that live in there, the soil's the same. But instead we're talking about the underground parts of those plants. So if you have a look at the diagram on the left here, you can see that um, there are lots of different types of plants and they all have different types of root systems and there are different types of um, soil organisms associated with those different roots. So a tree might have particular fungi and bacteria that are associated with its roots and that might be completely different to the fungi and bacteria that are associated with the roots of a grass species, for example. So in general, you've got quite a, a range of different types of resources within the soil. And if you focus in just on a little part of the soil like we have in the diagram um, on the right here, you can see that even within a small area within the soil, there's lots of different types of habitats. So for example, we have this root zone and lots of different fungi and bacteria can be associated with roots that exude different compounds that fungi and bacteria like to eat. But then we also have um, little water films within the soil. So the, the water being captured around the different um, parts of the soil. And so within those, those water films, you have different organisms living, little water things like tardigrades and things live in those water films. You also have big air pockets within soil and different things within living with those air pockets. And you have things like um, dead and dying bacteria. You have um, scats of animals. You have plant litter that's incorporated into the soil and they all provide different types of habitats. So you can see that it's quite a diverse system. It's not just dirt. There's lots and lots of um, diversity of habitat going on within that soil and that different habitat supports lots of different types of soil biota. One of the reasons that this is really important is that um, those different types of soil biota are really important in providing different um, functions within the ecosystem. So it's within the soil, for example, that we get lots of the decomposers living that break down the leaf litter that's on the surface or the, the scat material. They break that down into the soil and then um, decompose that and make those nutrients within the soil available for plants to take it up and, um, and grow some more. So they're really important for those different um, nutrient breakdown processes and a whole lot of other important um, ecosystem functions as well. As an example of this, um, uh, I'm going to pull out one and that is looking at nitrogen in the atmosphere and nitrogen within um, our soil. So uh, nitrogen is a really important uh, element for all life. It's one of the, the main building blocks of DNA and RNA and um, different proteins that we have in our body and plants and, anim and other animals have too. Um, but the main source of nitrogen globally is nitrogen in the atmosphere as in the form of, of nitrogen dioxide. It forms about 78% of our atmosphere. But animals and plants can't actually ac access that atmosphere, atmospheric nitrogen. The way that that nitrogen gets into our um, ecosystem cycles is through the um, work of nitrogen fixing bacteria. So these nitrogen fixing bacteria are often in nodules, as in the picture on the right. Um, and those nitrogen fixing bacteria are really one of the only ways that that nitrogen can be taken out of the atmosphere and um, into the soil and 
can be taken up by our plants and then eaten by other plants, then eaten by the animals. And that's how the nitrogen gets into the system. Um, the nitrogen cycle is completed by a lot of other bacteria and other nitrogen fixing organisms. So um, the different cycles of nitrogen and the different types of nitrogen that you find in the soil that can be taken up by plants are also, it's also controlled by different bacteria within the system. And there are also bacteria that turn um, soil nitrate back into atmospheric nitrogen too, to complete that kind of cycle. So it's just an example of one of the really important ecosystem functions that um, soil biota, particularly fungi and bacteria can play in our soils and how important that is for the overall health of the ecosystem. This, this is not just the case with nitrogen, it's also the case with phosphorus. There are fungi that are really important in um, phosphorus cycling. In the carbon cycle, there are lots of decomposer organisms that are really important um, for breaking down material and re releasing carbon back into the soil. And I think Peter touched on that a little bit before. So um, that nitrogen is just an example, but there are lots of really important um, fungi and bacteria in our soil, particularly that are really important for some of those um, ecosystem processes. Um, so one of the things that's happened in um, recent times is that you're probably um, familiar with the fact that we now have much more sophisticated molecular tools to understand the world around us. And you might be familiar with the term environmental DNA, which is a growing field where we're able to take small, say, water samples or soil samples and um, use special molecular techniques to look in those water or soil samples and see what's been in there. So we can pick up traces of particular organisms. So in water, we might be able to pick up traces of fish scales or something to show us what fish have been in that area. Um, this development of eDNA techniques has been really fantastic for looking at soil microbes, soil fungi and bacteria as well. And uh, it's allowed us to do what we haven't been able to do before and really look at a lot of those small organisms that look in soil and understand more about how they're distributed throughout the landscape and how they respond to different land uses. Um, so one example of this is the BASE project, which was the Biomes of Australian Soil um, Environments project, which was run um, through CSIRO and a few other partners, and also which is now morphed into the Australian Microbiome project. And I've put um, a bit of a map of some of the sites they sampled in the BASE project up on the left. So you can see all the little blue dots are different sites that were sampled throughout Australia. And basically what they did is that they collected soil from a range of different ecosystems. You can see that there are both native and agricultural ecosystems um, that were sampled. And they used these special molecular techniques. So they used the eDNA to understand what fungi and bacteria were found in these soils and how that varied throughout the landscape and in response to different land uses. So this has really changed the way that we can understand more about um, the microorganisms that are in our soils. And it's a really fantastic tool that's allowed us to do a whole lot of uh, new experiments and really try and understand what's going on in these systems and how they relate to soil health and soil carbon and other important ecosystem functions. So here's an example of how we might use this kind of data. This is an example from some work that I did a couple of years ago and we were um, comparing uh, an agricultural pasture system with the nearby remnant vegetation. And so we collected soil from both the pasture system and the, um, and the remnant vegetation. And we used the eDNA techniques to understand what sort of, uh, fungi and bacteria were in those soils. And um, so you can see on the right hand side here, this is an ordination plot. And basically each of the little squares or circles represents a different uh, collection of soil that we made and um, we can see uh, the further away the, the, the dots and the squares are the more different the um, microbial communities are and so you can see that the microbial communities so in the soil that came from the remnant vegetation were very different so they're quite a lot further away they're circled in red compared to the microbial communities in the soils that we collected from in the agricultural paddocks. And this is just a very basic kind of test that we're able to do very quickly and easily now. 
and really gives us a good understanding of how different agricultural practices and other practices are impacting the soil um, biota. So you can see here, this is a very common story that when you um, change land uses, you also change the soil biota. The other thing that's happened recently, um, um, relatively recently, is that we have a much better understanding of how soil organic matter is um, developed. So historically, we always thought that soil organic matter was just broken down um, leaf material and things like that in the soil and um, and um, was, was in the form of humus. But now we actually understand that a lot of the organic matter within the soil, and so a lot of the soil carbon is actually decomposing soil microbial biomass. Um, and so this is really important. So that's the purple fraction here. Um, and so this is a really important shift in terms of our thinking about um, how important those soil biota are, not just for um, recycling the nutrients within the soil, but also as an important fraction of the carbon and the organic matter within the soil. Um, and as Peter alluded to, organic matter is really important within the soil because it holds water within the soil. It retains, helps retain nutrients within the soil and it really improves that soil structure. So having uh, soils that are high in organic matter is really important to having good healthy soils that are able to, to function successfully in the landscape. Um, so conventional agriculture has really illustrated that um, uh, when, you, when you remove new vegetation and you replace it with a monoculture of crops that are often shallow rooted and not present in the environment for, you know, only in short rotation, so not present um, for the whole year, then you really are changing the, the types of environments um, within the soil that those soil biota can live. So it's really clear, and a lot of studies have shown now, that um, in conventional agricultural systems, you really do have a significant reduction in um, the plant diversity, of course, because you're replacing a forested or um, ecosystem or something like that with an agricultural monoculture. Um, but that also reducing the number of habitat diversity within the soil for the different microbes. And this leads to a reduction in the amount of soil microbes and soil biota within that soil, um, which also leads to a decrease in organic matter and a decrease in the natural nutrient cycling pathways that occur within the soil. Um, these reductions in soil biota and things uh, tend to lead to increased erosion, lots of topsoil because the soil isn't covered um, throughout the year with, um, with plants. Um, also things like soil compaction and poor drainage can occur. Um, and because you're getting a decrease in the natural nutrient cycling within the soil, then you need to increase your fertilizer inputs to maintain the same kind of productivity that you were having in your soil previously, and probably also increase pesticides and herbicides because the whole system is, is out of balance. Um, what there is now though is a move, it's not all bad, there is a move towards more sustainable agricultural practices. So things like organic agriculture and regenerative agriculture, um, that really acknowledge the fact that a healthy soil is going to lead to a really healthy agricultural system. Um, so I really like this quote from Finney and Makepeace, which is the big difference between conventional and regenerative agriculture is whether or not you're treating all soil as a living organism that constantly needs to be fed carbon via living plant roots. So in regenerative agriculture, for example, there are a number of different principles that are listed here, but the main tenant, I suppose, there are lots of different ways to approach regenerative and sustainable um, agriculture generally. Um, but it's mainly about improving that soil health to use some of those principles that we understand from um, natural ecosystems and trying to use those to improve the soil. So things like um, having less disturbance, so no-till systems, um, having ground cover all year round to protect the soil, to stop soil erosion, um, to have um, short rotation grazing, for example, is another tenant because it allows the pasture time to grow and recover and um, to sequester more carbon as well, 
to increasing the biodiversity within um, farming systems and also to have lots of living roots within the soil that can act as habitat for those soil microbes um, and allow those soil microbes to carry out their very important functions in terms of nutrient cycling and um, creating healthy soils. Um, there's a lot of work going on, particularly in regenerative agricultural research space at the moment, because a lot of people, um, um, a lot of people really um, are interested in regenerative agriculture, and a lot of people are trying out different things. But there's not a lot of good research data yet on how um, well regenerative agriculture is working and what different aspects of it work best. So one of the projects I'm involved with, for example, through the Centre for People, Place and Planet is working with some farmers um, down in Australia in the wheat belt, uh, looking at the impact of different regenerative methods on the carbon sequestration, but particularly on the soil microbes and the impact on organic matter within the soil. Um, through the Centre for People, Place and Planet as well, we're also looking at the follow-on effects of these different sustainable agricultural practices and whether they lead to um, healthier food products. So there's a lot of suggestion that um, organic and sustainable um, food is going to be better for you, that it has a healthier plant microbiome, a healthier soil microbiome, and that leads to a healthier microbiome and also food that has... Um, um, high nutrient content and things like that. So that's one of the other aspects of this kind of work that we're following through with at the moment. And I guess to take a, a, a step back and look back at ecosystem services again, um, what a lot of these uh, sustainable agricultural practices are really looking at is um, moving, is in some ways mimicking the natural, aggress um, natural ecosystem services, um, that including crop production in those ecosystem services. So kind of combining both, both the kind of ecosystem services you'd have in a natural ecosystem with those in the intensive cropland um, so that you can still produce crops, but you're also working with the environment and building it up and um, really keeping that soil healthy, sequestering carbon, um, and having lots of healthy soil microbes in there, um, and then leading hopefully to a much healthier kind of agricultural ecosystem. So um, that's all I really wanted to say. I guess um, the main thing that I really wanted to, to share with you is the fact that these soil microbes are really critical for keeping the soils healthy and um, that there are lots of exciting and um, very small things living within our soil that are doing really important jobs and that there are um, agricultural practices that are emerging that are really critical um, and useful for working with the soil to support the soil processes and um, to improve ecosystem services that they provide. Okay, so that's all from me. I'm um, hand over to Beryl. Fabulous, Anna. Thank you so much. And I love the, the wind up of it's it's all very important to have those things in the soil. Um, we've had a couple of questions in the Q&A which have been answered. Perhaps our panel would like to put their um, videos, back, their photos back up or their live pictures. Um, so the Q&As, if you'd like to check the answers that have been already typed in there and a bit of dialogue that's been going in there. But I have a couple of questions that have, um, have come up that haven't been answered. So Ben, um, you've made the point that uh, agroecosystem monitoring is a bit ad hoc at the moment, both over space and time. So what key things do you think that we should be consistently um doing over time and space to quantify ecosystem function we, we, what would be your top ones you put on it thanks beryl um well first you'd probably want to look at um different land uses and different crop uh, different uh, agricultural systems and how they're represented currently and what what potentially could have um the largest net inputs and outputs, and you might want to, you know, select it that way. Um, if you identify a location, then what I'd, what you'd probably like to measure would be net ecosystem exchange, fundamental hydro hydrological um, function, the crop crop or pasture or 
or production performance, much like you do with the you know, uh, native system, but um, you just want to do it in an agricultural system and capture all those components. Because one of the, the key things which we find is you know, when we go to for crop modeling, we don't have all the detailed information we need, particularly around um, water balance, energy balance, uh, the, the CO2 exchange, et cetera. Fantastic, thank you. And Peter, something that came up in your area. So you, you give the impression that improved management of agricultural soils can provide the solutions to global warming. Um, how much, how important do you think that the capabilities of our terrestrial ecosystem monitoring observatory, TURN, can uh, contribute in the way of data for giving solutions in that area? Any comments? Yeah, look, as I mentioned uh, earlier, it, um, the, the, the soils map for Australia, okay, it's, um, it's not as detailed as many other countries, but under the circumstances, it provides that core information about texture. Uh, clay soils are, are, are critical, have, have a big impact on greenhouse gas emissions. One, you can, so, you can basically sequester more carbon in a clay soil compared to a, a sandy textured soil. Also, clay soils tend to waterlog, don't drain as well. You get more nitrous oxide from them. Um, We've done studies in other countries where we've actually mapped carbon sequestration hotspots, but um, you could do that here too, exactly with the, the data that's being produced. Mm. And again, Ausflux, um, it's, it could be expanded. It has. It's got great capability, world-class capability, and uh, it is being used and is expanding. And we're just fortunate that we do have public-private investments looking at this as well. Um, whilst we're concentrating on soil carbon at the moment, I mean, it's the flux systems are carbon, are, uh, are measuring carbon, trees, everything. So anything to do with measurement, uh, highly, highly accurate. And, um, and, and as I showed, integrates a lot of information across a landscape, a lot of data. Yeah. And uh, that's, what, that's what you really need to see. You need to see on, on an area basis. Okay, and uh, really, really quickly, Anna, this might be a yes and no. I'm getting the impression because you've been able to demonstrate the importance of all those microbes to, eco, to, to the health of uh, soils and ecosystem services. Would you like TURN to have a, 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 a continent-wide monitoring program to assist in that area of making sure that we've got a handle on how the microbes in that are going? I think that would be brilliant, Beryl. Yes, <laughs> that's a very easy question. A very big yes. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you very much to everyone that has stayed with us throughout this talk. I think you'll, I, I found it really impressive. It's great. So thanks for joining us. And now um, just show up our, our last slide to show you that we have got another webinar coming up on the 6th of July, I think, on the topic of Monitoring Threatened Species. Uh, TURN has recently become the coordinator of the Threatened Species Index, and we've got a fabulous panel of speakers for you on that date. So we look forward to seeing you all, and thanks for joining us today. Goodbye. <laughs>